raise your hand, and you will need a Bible. We're not going to show you every uh, a verse on the screen. If we did, it wouldn't be any need to bring your Bibles, right? Okay. <laughs> so, we will... Uh, so you will be needing a Bible. Also, we have uh, devices to translate this in Spanish. So just tell the usher you want a device. And uh, for the sermon to be translated to you within Spanish. But our scripture reading today, we want to start off. It's going to be Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Somewhere I put my glass. If you'll stand, we read God's word. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw that what seemed to be tongues of fire that were se separate, separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language. Parinthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, 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 Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Py Pyria, Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya, Serene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts of Judaism, Cretans, Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonder of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Peter addressed the crowd. The Peter, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It is only nine in the morning. Now this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will sh show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. So say God's word. You may be seated. God, our Heavenly Father, Father, we, we ask that your Holy Spirit work on each of us in a mighty way, in a way that, that we need. Open our hearts. That's the praise song we sing. Open our hearts to your word, to your message. How does it apply to us? Help us become more Christ-like, Father. Convict us where we need to be convicted of our sins so we can continue to be in your graces. So, Father, we ask you open our hearts, our ears, our mind to the message today. And meditate on this during the week. And of course, to share it with others, Father. We lift this prayer to you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 We know that <clears throat> according to the Jewish calendar, 
today is, uh, is Pentecost Sunday. And many of you may not be familiar with Pentecost Sunday because uh, maybe you have never heard that term before, Pentecost Sunday. So to help you understand what Pentecost Sunday is, th let's reflect back on Pentecost. Most of us are familiar with Pentecost. Some refer to as the, the Feast of Pentecost, the Day of Pentecost. So many of, of us are familiar with Pentecost. So let's take a look at Pentecost and this will help us get a better understanding of Pentecost Sunday. Now the first mention of some of the events that would take place in Pentecost was mentioned by really by John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 verse 11. John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water for repentance. But after he, after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. John the Baptist here was speaking of those he was baptizing. He was at the river baptizing people at that time and the Pharisees came up and he was speaking to those who were being baptized and also to the Pharisees who were, who were there. See, John the Baptist was speaking of some, some events that was going to happen at Pentecost, but John the Baptist was not aware of these events that were going to take place. He wasn't aware that Pentecost was going to happen at this time, okay? So he was mentioning some of these events that would take place at Pentecost. Let me slow down because the translator is going to have a problem translating this in Spanish if I speak too fast. So this is what John the Baptist was referring to, some events that would take place at Pentecost. These same events was mentioned by Peter, the writer of the Acts. And he mentioned these, these events in, in, in uh, chapter 1, verses 3 to 5 of Acts. He says, after his suffering, and he's speaking of Jesus Christ here, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, that you have heard me speak about. For John the Baptist baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Peter also is making uh, is referring to events that would happen at Pentecost. See, if we look at this verse, we can see that Jesus remained on the earth 40 days after his resurrection. See, he, he appeared to them multiple times, and he, appeared, he was eating with them at this time, and he told them they were, they were on the outskirts of Jerusalem, not that far out. And he told them, go back to Jerusalem. He said, wait in Jerusalem, wait a few days, and you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So they go back to Jerusalem, to the house that many of the disciples were staying in, and they went up to the upper room, and so they waited. Okay. We know that they waited one day. They waited two days. Three days and nothing, and they know Jesus said, hey, Wait in a few days you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. But they didn't know what that meant, being baptized by the Holy Spirit. Okay? So they're waiting to see what was going to happen at this time. Because they weren't really sure what was going to happen. Four days passed, five days okay, passed. And then, the tenth day, here's what happened in Acts, the second chapter. But we had just read verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, Pentecost simply means 50. This is 10 days later. Jesus was on the earth 40 days, and 10 days later is when the Holy Spirit arrived. Pentecost simply means 50 or the 50th day. And this is what Pentecost Sunday is about. It's the 50th day from Jesus' resurrection. 50th day from Easter. If you go back and count, you'll see. It's the seventh Sunday from Easter. If you count Easter, it's eight Sundays. 
Seven days in a week, seven sevens is 49, and count the Sunday Easter is 50 days. So this is what Pentecost Sunday is all about. This is what Pentecost is all about, okay? But it goes on to say, suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They were no longer in the upper room. This is 10 days later. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit called them. So here they begin to speak in these other tongues. Okay. Pentecost is also known by the Festival of Weeks. It's one of the second most important festivals that the Jews would, would hold. And as we read earlier, verse 5, which isn't up there, it said that there were Jews there from every nation under heaven. And as we read, we read of 12 or 13 different locations that they came from. So Jews had come from all over. There were thousands of Jews there. They had no idea what was about to happen. They didn't know that 120 disciples, men and women both, were going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now there's a difference in being filled with the Holy Spirit, and if you check, baptized by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say baptized in the Holy Spirit. It says baptized by the Holy Spirit. There is a difference. But these 120 disciples, as you say, they were filled by the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in the various tongues of the people that came from every nation, the scripture says, under heaven. Now this is very important. Because God in his wisdom, what he did, he took advantage of, or he allowed his disciples now to fulfill the commandment that he gave them at Matthew 28, 19, and 20. And if you look at Matthew 20, 19, and 20, it says, therefore, and Jesus commanded his disciples, make disciples of all nations, there are Jews there from every nation under the sun. It says baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That day, if you read Acts, 3,000 people got baptized that day. 3,000 people except for Jesus as their Lord and Savior. There are 3,000 converts that day. This is the first fulfillment of Matthew 28, 19, and 20. The good news of the gospel was preached to all the known earth at that time. Okay? And 3,000 people surrendered their life to God. So God took advantage of that time where they were there for the Festival of Weeks. The Festival of Weeks really was the, the first harvest. Mainly, it, it was the wheat harvest at that time. It was the time where they would take the first fruits of the harvest and give it 10% to God. So it was a very important time for them, this festival of weeks. Why is Pentecost Sunday important? Here's why here. Pentecost Sunday, it is a commemoration of the church receiving the promised gift of the Holy Spirit from the Father. God had promised to give us that gift. And it happened on the day of Pentecost. It is recognized... It recognizes this day as the beginning of the church as we know it, okay? This is why it's important. It marks the day that all true believers in Christ will now receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, really, baptism of the Holy Spirit, at the time of their conversion. And this is why Pentecostal Sunday, our Pentecost Sunday, is very, very important. Some people wonder, will say, well, who is the Holy Spirit? Some people say, say who, what is the Holy Spirit? See, there's a lot of confusion sometimes <clears throat> over the Holy Spirit and who he is. Some people refer to the Holy Spirit as it and not even who. There are many cults out there who refer the Holy Spirit or they teach the Holy Spirit as some kind of mystical force that you can't see. I know one cult religion that teaches that they uses the analogy that the Holy Spirit is just a, like electricity. You know, some force that does work for God. 
There's some confusion even among God's people of who the Holy Spirit really is. Some of God's people look at the Holy Spirit as some impersonal power that God gives us at the time of our conversion to accommodate us. Some people look at the Holy Spirit in that respect. But what does the Bible have to say who the Holy Spirit is? Simply put, the Bible says the Holy Spirit is God. Amen? Amen. Okay. The Holy Spirit is God. The Bible, all the scripture shows us that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit has many of the same attributes as God. Okay. He has emotions. Okay. The scripture tells us do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay. And we grieve him by sinning and not repenting. So we can see the Holy Spirit has emotion. If you go to Genesis 6, 6, we don't have a scripture on that, but Genesis 6, 6 showed that God was sorrowful that he had even created mankind. This is before the flood because man had delved so much into sin. See, so showing that he has emotion. The Holy Spirit is divine, righteous, and holy. The same attributes as God, okay? The Holy Spirit is omnipresent, meaning that can be everywhere at once, simultaneously. And the millions and millions of believers, or maybe billion or so believers in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in each one of them. He can be omnipresent. The Holy Spirit, omnipotent, all-knowing, has all knowledge, knows everything, okay? Simply put, the Holy Spirit is God the third person of the Trinity. Believers in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit at the time of our conversion. We receive the Holy Spirit when we finally surrender our life to Christ. We receive the Holy Spirit when we finally accept Him as our Lord and Savior. We receive the Holy Spirit as that free gift when we finally repent of our sins and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's at the time, that's during our conversion, that's when we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But once we receive that free gift of the Holy Spirit, we should look at the Holy Spirit to guide us in our life, to give us direction in our life. That's what the Holy Spirit is here to help us do, to give us direction. He helps us, he convicts us of sin in his guidance. On a regular basis, I pray to God, God, to the Holy Spirit, please, make my sin, make me aware of my sins so I can repent, so I can stay in good graces with God. So the Holy Spirit is here to convict us of sin, so we can repent over those sins, so we can stay in good graces of God. Okay? Many people say, well, my conscience told me to do this. My conscience told me to do that. See, the Holy Spirit will work through our conscience, but you must be careful. If your conscience is telling you to do something or prompting you to do something that is sinful, if it's prompting you to do something that's against God's will, if it's prompting you to do something that's against the Scriptures, then indeed, that little voice you hear there that is prompting you, it, it, it's not the Holy Spirit. Okay? <laughs> That's our own flesh trying to tell us to do a certain thing and not the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is here to help us. The Holy Spirit is here to guide us in our walk, in our walk with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is to assist us in our walk with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is here to teach us the scriptures. Many times you're reading the scripture, if there's something you don't understand, Stop and say, God, Holy Spirit, please help me get an understanding of this. I do this all the time. You'll be surprised. Most of the time, the Holy Spirit will put the meaning of that in your mind. Sometimes it's the next day. That's what he's here. He said he, he will bring back the remembrance of those things, either we read or heard through a sermon or whatever. But do we trust him to do that? Is something we don't know? We grab a book written by somebody who read a, a book and wrote a book, who read a book and wrote a book, and we get their opinion on it. 
or we grab a dictionary, get their opinion. You ever thought about maybe asking the Holy Spirit to help you? <laughs> Understanding of that? Trust me, it works. It actually works. But he is here to teach us all things to bring back to us, okay? The Holy Spirit is here to help us remain obedient and faithful in our walk with the Lord. So what we want to know is, am I being led by the Holy Spirit? One way to determine if you're being led by the Holy Spirit is by your fruits, okay? The fruits of the Spirit. Look at the fruits of the Spirit, okay? Is this some of the fruit we're producing? Love towards everyone, love towards our neighbor, okay? Our, do we have a fruit of joy with everyone? Of peace, patience, goodness, kindness. Do we have these in our lives? These are the fruits that we should have in our life because once at our conversion, we were given the Holy Spirit. These are fruits that now we should be producing in our lives. These fruits will show us, yes, I am being driven by the Holy Spirit. Yes, the Holy Spirit is guiding me. The Holy Spirit is leading me. The Holy Spirit helps us or intercedes with us many times when we're praying. We may be praying for someone we don't even know their name. We may be praying for someone we don't even really realize the situation that they're in. We may be praying for the lost on the other side of the world. We don't know, okay? Which you should be doing, praying for the lost. The Holy Spirit will intercede. The Holy Spirit will intercede to make sure those prayers when they reach the throne, see, they are correct. So the Holy Spirit's here to intercede in our prayers. Amen. See, we need the Holy Spirit. There's no way that we can get a, live our life in a God-like manner without the Holy Spirit. And Jesus realized this, and this is why he said what he did at John 16, 17. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus said, it is to our advantage, <laughs> okay, that he sends us his Holy Spirit. Can you imagine trying to live your life as a Christian without the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine trying to live your life without producing those fruits of the Spirit that we said? No desire to show love, patience, goodness, kindness towards people or faith. Can you imagine trying to live your life and fighting the spiritual welfare on your own without the Holy Spirit there to help you fight this spiritual welfare? Can you imagine trying to live your life, trying to understand the scriptures and the Holy Spirit's not there to give you this understanding of the scriptures? Can you imagine trying to live your life trying to please God without the Holy Spirit? Can you imagine trying to live your life in a godly way without ever being convicted when you sin? See, Jesus knew it'd be to our advantage to have the Holy Spirit. He helps us in our walk. He helps us to live a life that is pleasing to God that we cannot possibly do without him. There's another advantage of having the Holy Spirit living in you. He also gives us the gifts of the Spirit. We all have at least one gift of the Spirit. See, he gives us the gifts of the Spirit. Some of us have the gifts of the Spirit, but sometimes they are some of the less common gifts of the Spirit. And because it's one of the less common gifts of the Spirit, sometimes we're hesitant to use that because we don't want to go out on a limb and, and people looking at us, so we're kind of hesitant to use that. See, some of us have these unique gifts of, of the Spirit that we have been blessed with that we hold back on using, okay? See, because we've seen, we see on TV all the time the misuse and the abuse of spiritual gifts. And we don't want to fall in that category. A lot of churches now are conservative in that area with people who may have these uncommon 
gifts of the Spirit. Because they don't want to see them misuse that particular gift within the church or abuse that gift. But many of us have, and all of us have gifts of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts are very important in building the church. The spiritual gifts are very important regarding the spirituality of the church. Jesus said at Hebrews 13, 8, Hebrews 13, 8, it says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus doesn't change. Jesus is God. God doesn't change. We just showed you. Holy Spirit is God. Holy Spirit doesn't change. He gave those gifts at the early church. He still gives us those very same gifts today. He has not changed at all. And just... And for those of you who may be wondering, yes, Oasis Church, which is part of the Christian Reformed Church, we believe in all those spiritual gifts and that they are still available today from the Holy Spirit. And that is the belief of Oasis. <laughs> Concerning the spiritual gifts, Paul tells in 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, 12 verses 1 through 11. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestations of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. All gifts come from the Holy Spirit. He distributes them as he sees. Some of us may be born with a certain ability. You could call it a gift. Either case, it came from God, okay? But some of the gifts, and if you use that gift, if you become born again Christian, use that gift, it will be enhanced. Some of us, God will slowly develop that gift. He may develop it through your job. Maybe you become a manager because God wants to use you later on within his church as a teacher to teach people. Okay. Or to be a leader, let's say. In a secular world, he may have led you in to be a teacher because now he wants to use you in his church as a teacher. Maybe because of your job, uh, you're in a position where you have to speak to large groups of people to get used to that because he wants to make you a pastor or a preacher. So God may slowly spend many, many years developing your gift like he did with Moses, 40 years getting educated by the Egyptians, the highest education you could possibly get and, and learn to be a leader, and then 40 years in the wilderness. So for all be preparing 80 years to pray to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. So God sometimes will slowly develop your gift 
to be used by him so he gets the praise and glory to whatever we're good at doing, no matter what it is. We can't take that credit ourselves, but it's the Holy Spirit working in us. Now, some of us, we will not really realize the gift that we have until maybe after our conversion, because maybe we're put in a, a certain ministry within the church, and at that time we realize that we have a certain gift. But we all do have some gift of the Spirit. So let's look at some of the gifts of the Spirit. Can you identify with any of those? Maybe more than one. Maybe three, four, five, or six. Look at the gift of ministration. As far as I'm concerned, that's a rare gift. <laughs> it's needed within the church. I don't have it. <laughs> it's needed within the church, see? Very important gift. Discernment. How often... Almost all of us pray for discernment, okay? Encouragement, that's a gift. Faith is a gift. Healing, a gift, okay? Knowledge, leadership, miracles, mercy. Look at the many gifts, and this is not all. We, let, we read about a bunch of them there in 1 Corinthians, okay, chapter 12, 1 through 11. Some gifts here. And there's one gift here I, I know that, that that's missing because some of you, and I know personally, you have the gift of gab. <laughs> oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe that shouldn't be. Is that from the Holy Spirit, the gift of gab? Okay. <laughs> you know I'm joking, all right? Okay. Um, <laughs> but look at those gifts probably more than one apply to you what you need to find if you haven't been to a spiritual gifts class there's some tests that you can taste and I recommend taking that class to identify your gift identify which one is the strongest okay? to which is the strongest two or three or four gifts so you can now use them the gift that the Holy Spirit has given you. How are you supposed to use these gifts? As you say, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7, for the common good of everyone. The spiritual gifts are used for us to minister to each other. The spiritual gifts are used to help us build the church. And then it's to be used to those outside the church. But it's for the common good of all, and it's given to help build our church. Now, who are these gifts for? Peter says in Acts 2nd chapter, verse 30 and 39, now it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? But for who? The promise is for you, it's for us. Your children, okay, that you may not even have, it, maybe not married or have it, but it's you, but it's for your children. And for all, far all. This is 2,000 years ago. We are those people far all. And to prove that the spiritual gifts are forever, they didn't die out like some people think, and for all whom the Lord our God will call. The spiritual gifts are still available for us, our children, all those who are far off, not even born yet, all those who are called, because you can't have it unless you are called by God except Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It is sad, though, to see that some people don't believe that the spiritual gifts are still available, or some of them. It's sad because now the Holy Spirit can't use them in a way maybe that he really wants to use them in a mighty way. They can't be used. Because maybe from their background or our church that they were from or the way they were raised that, oh no, the spiritual gifts no longer, the spiritual gifts no longer apply. So therefore, that's stuck in their mind and therefore, they don't have complete faith when it comes to using their spiritual gifts. Okay. They may not believe in the gift of healing. So then, why should God heal them? Why should he heal them? They don't have faith in it. Why bother to pray to be healed? This is important. I'm going to show you coming up here soon. Your belief is very important. It tells us in Hebrews, without faith, impossible 
to please God. See, you must believe it. If not, it limits your performance. Let me show you an example with Jesus and Mark. Matter of fact, we have to read that. In Mark, ch chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now, this is Jesus. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get this, these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, J Judas, S okay. Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own home, in his own town, among his relatives, in his own home. He could not do many, any miracles. He could, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Even with Jesus, he was limited in the miracles that he could do because of their lack of faith. I don't know if you know it. I gave a sermon once on the miracles of Jesus at, at my other church. You may not know this, but almost every miracle, almost every healing that Jesus did, not all, Almost all. He always said, according to your faith, be healed according to your faith. It will be doing, done according to your faith. Jesus has complete faith. He can do what he wants. But how the Holy Spirit responds to us in prayer, how he responds to the gift that we may have. Maybe we have the gift of healing or miracles or whatever. If we don't have complete faith in it, it's not going to happen. Even with Jesus, he was limited in the miracles he could do because of their unbelief. It's very important. See, some people don't believe in the spiritual gifts. They think, well, it was, a, it was there for building up the church. Well, what I'd say about that, you go to third world countries or undeveloped countries, they're still building the church, okay? <laughs> and some people say, well, the spiritual gifts are, are, are to win over the pagans, the heathen, and the lost. And what I say to that, there's more pagans, heathen, and lost in the world today than ever before. <laughs> so we need those gifts now today than ever before. Yes, the spiritual gifts are still available to us. You have some. Identify what they are. Have complete faith in that gift. It may be one of the uncommon ones. So be it. God decided to bless you with that. But use it to his praise and his glory. So once again, as Peter said in Acts 2.39, who is these gifts for? For us, our children, those in the community. We need to minister with them. We need to <coughs> minister to those within the church, use our gift to help build up oases. And then use them on our relatives, our friends, our family. Who promised this gift to us? Exalted to the right hand of God, this is Jesus. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit. The Father promised us this gift of the Holy Spirit once we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So we can say Pentecost Sunday, yes, it's important. 
Pentecost Sunday is a recognition when the Father kept that promise where he gave the church, which is us, the gift of the Holy Spirit once we surrender our life to Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's close now, and I want you all to stand and pray with me, and let's thank God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's, let's stand, let's raise our hands to God. Okay. God, our Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for such a glorious gift such a wonderful gift, Father, is the Holy Spirit that we cannot do without, Father. He convicts us of sin. He guides us on the paths of righteousness and obedience to you. Father, he teaches us the scriptures. He teaches us your word, Father. Father, he intercedes in our prayers as we pray to you when we're not knowing what to pray. Father, your word says that you will give the gift abundantly to those who will ask, and that's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thank you so much for this gift, Father, from a loving Father as you, and the gift of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, and we lift this prayer up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.